how that would be controversial uh, for our discussions and what we all collectively think about the fundamental importance of micro-credentials, except we haven't dealt with a lot of the major problems of the world. Refugees and migrants were mentioned very briefly, but this picture for me is a reminder of the important work that you're doing. This, I took this picture in Herat, Afghanistan, when I was there in 2019. This was my third visit, and just off camera that I had to crop were two women smiling with a big peace sign. And just off camera, that feeling of women attending university in Afghanistan was so inspiring and so much about the open future that we were about to embrace uh, that it just made me more hopeful than ever uh, to be on that trip. And just a few years later, we know that that's not possible anymore, that women and girls are no longer welcome at universities, no longer to complete education. So that means halfway through the degree, sometimes you're unable to access and complete a quality assured degree program. The fundamental importance of your work goes far beyond Europe in terms of provision and in terms of achieving collective goals. So we know that this is important and our director general of UNESCO put this out there um, as the only UN agency with responsibility in higher education and you know, lifelong learning as a whole, including sustainable development goal four, this quote for me is really important to dedicate our minds and our contributions in this space to Afghan women and girls. Um, that no country in the world should, should bar women and girls from receiving an education. Education is a universal human right. Okay? So these are points of departure for me in our conversation about micro-credentials and their purpose, and certainly about the futures of education. So this is just some starting points about how UNESCO approaches this right uh, from two fundamental perspectives as we think ahead about what is this new social contract for education going to look like? Something that the International Commission on the Futures of Education called for. UNESCO asked us collectively to think about where we are headed. Two points of departure. To make sure that we're thinking about micro-credentials in this context of how are we assuring the right to quality education throughout, right, throughout our lives, right? So that's Article 26, the De Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Fundamental starting points that we need to be thinking about uh, human rights-based perspective and the important work that you're doing. The second was how are we strengthening education as a public endeavor and a common good? Shouldn't be too controversial but in the context and conversations of micro-credentials, are we upholding these two fundamental principles at all time and for all learners around the world? Points of departure in your discussions and thinking on this topic as we transform and promote the future that we all know needs to take place. We know that we're not on track with Sustainable Development Goal 4. We know micro-credentials could play a role, but we're not sure how. That's that question mark. The standard definition that UNESCO is working with right now, which I assume many of you contributed to, this was a global stock-taking exercise, uh, and you know, looking at this four-part definition, I won't go into each dimension because I think we've already decided that this is not the main focus to grapple with definitions, but what it looks like in practice, specifically in Asia Pacific in this context. So we're looking at um, micro-credentials as a working definition, you know, looking at the focused learning achievement, the fundamentals around assessment, talking about the standalone value in the marketplace and for sustainable development, but also you know, meeting the fundamentals around quality assurance, okay? Too often we're talking about transformation of higher education, but we're trying to push in towards adult learning and putting that in the context of the lifelong learning goals that we set out in 2015. Sustainable Development Goal 4, at least in Asia Pacific, we are far from on track. Um, so linking this work to get us on track for Agenda 2030 is fundamental, right? So we're talking about a transformation of education. Again, micro-credentials being one means of many others that can help us get there. So this definition is where we started. UNESCO Bangkok uh, looked at eight use cases around Asia Pacific. We collected you know, to understand where the countries were in their use of this definition and how they're understanding this. But to date, only Australia, New Zealand, and Malaysia. Those are the only three of the eight that we looked at that have a working definition of micro-credentials. Many others are experimenting in this, and I'll show you work from Indonesia today. And experimenting in this area is where we are in Asia Pacific, but your help and engagement in that development space is gonna be really interesting work going forward. And I think it's gonna be something we need to dive in deeper in your conversation. All right, so UNESCO's role. So I cover 46 countries in Asia Pacific, 60% of the world's population, it's too big, right? Huge, but within that, we focus in on what's called the Tokyo Convention on Qualifications Recognition. You have the Lisbon Convention, the Tokyo Convention is its you know, equivalent, 
that links on to the Global Convention on Higher Education. These UN treaties are how we promote fairness and transparency. And Japan, as president, came up with this idea to really use these normative instruments that promote fairness, promote transparency, and start talking about qualifications recognition to really achieve our collective goals. And I really like this quote uh, from Shingo Aishisawa, who was the president at the time, that in Asia Pacific, member states together explored the importance and the effective use of the Tokyo Convention, including focusing more on recognition of non-traditional learning and micro-credentials, which will ultimately help us to achieve the SDGs. Again, when you put that into a policy space and a bunch of countries you know, agree to it and say that we're gonna implement, that's how change is taking shape in Asia Pacific. So we're excited that that's out there as a statement and that there's collective agreement that micro-credentials are relevant, um, but we need your help to kind of think about what those programs will look like, what recognition will look like across borders. Many, many open questions um, that we can get into uh, in a few minutes. So here's an example of what that working definition looks like. This is an exciting uh, micro-credential that I've been involved with for several years in Indonesia. Um, it's basically a game developer micro-credential in five tracks. Uh, some of them are not there. I think game programmer and educational design games is not there. But the idea is that within these specializations, we can contribute to a capstone project. So while there's not a, a defined definition at this point for micro-credentials in Indonesia that's aligned with the qualification framework, et cetera, there are micro-credentials that are being rolled out by public universities. This is by the Open University of Indonesia. So some exciting experimentation taking place. And again, what this means in terms of its links to industry at the capstone projects, really exciting developments and, and work underway. So we do have many examples that we can kind of unpack together and the challenges that go with uh, you know, defining and getting industry involvement in this space. So I'll be in Jakarta next week working with on some of these issues. So these are, you know, when you look at those common challenges, it's just another way to look at the same material of that micro-credentials program. I think all of you are familiar with these common challenges there on the left. So I won't go into each of them in detail. The spirit being that we face uh, common concerns about access and quality around affordability and inclusion, uh, stackability, interoperability, right? Where does this particular program fit in terms of addressing these common challenges? Uh, verification of learning and assessment, certainly a component. Um, transparency around quality. We're going to come back to that in terms of how we think of transparency and accountability. How are we going to measure that? Um, but what this slide is really showing you is that we're really at an early stage, not only in Indonesia, but in Asia Pacific, about this first level of building trust, about sharing information about what's in that system, what's in that credential, right? So there's many, many opportunities around Asia Pacific about sharing authoritative information, largely centralized systems, defining and helping explain what, what a micro-credential needs and should look like in a specific context. So that's where we are in Asia Pacific. Uh, very early stages of development and building trust. That's the role of the Tokyo Convention and the Qualifications uh, Recognition Convention uh, of building trust through authoritative information sharing, right? So this is where these normative instruments play a role in, in promoting fairness and transparency, but increasingly around micro-credentials. How many of you are aware or following that the Global Convention is now in force, right? Yeah, so we need more countries to ratify and get involved in this because ultimately what I hope for this group is that this type of forum becomes a type of champion working group to guide implementation of the Global Convention on Higher Education. That's my personal uh, thinking, but the idea is that specific working groups that have rich knowledge about recognition need to guide implementation of the member states. Because when you have countries that get together that make policy decisions about recognition and talk about micro-credentials, they're gonna need background, they're gonna need in-depth analysis and examples and use cases. So Asia Pacific has use cases, the eight that I mentioned, they vary in terms of readiness, but many of you have really deep expertise, not only in collaboration across borders, but working with industry. So I would like to hear your thoughts on what collaboration might look like when the state parties meet later this year, the first intergovernmental meeting of the Global Convention. Chiara, hello, good to see you. And, and I'd love to see Chiara and you know, others contribute to this talk because this is exactly the type of expert forum where you could um, shape that type of implementation through policy analysis. So we're excited about that. We're excited also that that's not enough. <laughs> we don't want to create one superstructure, that there's going to be regional expertise. Um, the Asia Pacific Tokyo Convention is going to be a place for regional governance and recognition issues. You're going to see China step up in a very big way, I'm quite sure. You're going to see Indonesia and others you know, work on their ratification of these conventions and kind of join that decision-making space. 
so that when they come to these larger forums, you're going to see a voice from Asia Pacific, right? That voice is obviously underrepresented, right? 46 you know, member states in Asia Pacific. I don't think we have a large representation, but that's okay. You know, that's where we are at, in terms of the dialogue and readiness to discuss micro-credentials at scale. Right? But Asia Pacific is, is incredibly interested, just building readiness at this point, kind of building trust. Right? But this type of forum, the connection between the Tokyo Convention and the Global Convention is a forum where I think you can have great influence. I think collectively, your voices expanded out to include uh, what UNESCO calls Global Priority Africa, obviously. You know, there are massive continents underrepresented in the room um, that, that together we can you know, explore this complexity and explore the way forward. And that's really what I think is most interesting about this opportunity. So UNESCO going forward is gonna be building flexible lifelong learning pathways. This is from our, our work plan in TVET, but it's certainly applicable to your work, um, that we're gonna work on quality frameworks for micro-credentials, including the internationally agreed definitions, you know, building consensus beyond Europe um, for standards and quality assurance and principles for stacking and interoperability. So this is a commitment and a way forward and again, how you see this unfolding is gonna be important, especially in your collaborations outside of Europe. I would love to see and hear your ideas on how you're cooperating uh, and how this is expanding internationalization um, and access to opportunity, as we mentioned for Afghanistan. All right, everyone okay? That's enough of the, the, the UNESCO kind of rollout, right? But this is more of my personal thinking of the challenges of getting that done. Because working with UNESCO and working with these larger structures also comes with, uh, a, it's a heavy lift, right? Getting governments to understand and commit to, to micro-credentials as a transformative approach is a heavy lift, right? So this is my personal approach. This is not from UNESCO, but it's about the research around accountability. And I think this is not a topic that's you know, obvious, but we think of accountability in, a, in simplistic ways. You know, it's a general term. It applies to everything, so let's just leave it. So by the end of this talk, in the next few minutes, I'd like you to think about five different dimensions of accountability, right? And it comes from this conceptual framework, um, and this is on my work in ASEAN, which is Southeast Asia, and this is public administration type thinking. But basically it's saying that in a, in a, in a specific context of work, for example, quality assurance of micro-credentials, we're gonna be looking at a problem-driven approach to collaboration. So when you're developing new micro-credentials, what is the urgent you know, felt need in that moment? What's important? Um, in terms of uh, the problems that need to be solved for that micro-credential, right? So outcomes and accountabilities are the only part I'm gonna unpack today. What does that mean when you're working in a collaborative space around development of micro-credentials and outcomes and accountabilities? So we're just gonna unpack that part C. All right, so here are the different dimensions. It's based on work um, from Jonathan Koppel on transparency, liability, controllability, responsibility and responsiveness. And these prompts and questions are something that I think will help us give a different perspective on why you know, what we're doing is relevant. And ultimately these questions I think are, are important to think because of increasing engagement and in, in who is creating uh, micro-credentials going forward. So accountability is a topic that I'm personally interested in and would like to think collectively as a community on how we're going to tackle uh, you know, the role in the future of higher education and in lifelong learning in particular. So did the provider reveal the facts of its performance? Again, the normative instruments from UNESCO say that transparency is important, but what does that mean? We need to break it down further, right? Liability. Did the provider face consequences for its performance? These are locally based issues. What does that liability consequence look like in terms of governance? Controllability. This is not control of the credential. This is controllability. When you set out a piece of policy, did that influence the end result, right? Controllability. Responsibility, did the provider follow the rules in a specific context of cooperation and development? That might be professional standards, right? Did the provider follow the rules and responsiveness? Did the provider fulfill the substantive expectation, both in the demand sense and in the needs, for example, in sustainable development? It's gonna get more complex, are you ready? All right. So the more complex is that this is happening in formal settings and in informal settings. Lena mentioned this as well in terms of user forums. So when we think about transparency, liability, controllability, responsibility, and responsiveness, those five dimensions, we're looking at how that contributes to relevance, right? But this is happening not only in government formal channels, 
or institutional channels, a lot of your work at institutional level, but also informal level, that students have a voice, learners have a voice. So let's think about accountability along these different dimensions and be comfortable with describing this work in different contexts. So this is where complex accountabilities is a very rich discussion about how we are responding to needs and how we're gonna be relevant for lifelong learning going forward. So for example, some examples of transparency, uh, open data. What are our open data systems of performance worldwide? How do we implement and understand the role of the Tokyo and Global Convention? Again, your contributions to that policy space. How is that described? How we even understand what a trusted provider is uh, in terms of liability? What is a trusted provider who is accountable in different settings? Liability is a big issue. Recourse, which is the right to appeal, of course. When there's a discrepancy, do students have a right to appeal? That's also in the conventions. Controllability is the self-sovereignty issues of controlling your own data, the interoperability issues, quality registers of controllability. When we set policy, how is that implemented? Responsibility. How do providers follow rules in different settings? Right? Very interesting description as we think about ecosystems level uh, of how we are creating and promoting cross-sector cooperation for the development of, of micro-credentials at scale. And the expected results. Um, are we achieving expected results in your individual programs all the way up to uh, the larger systems and goals that we set to address issues around equity and employability uh, for, for opportunities for all? And together, it's why is this important? And that's the relevance piece. Why, is this, why does this matter? Why, does, why do micro-credentials matter beyond employability, right? How do they get us on track to impact national level indicators on the sustainable development goals? This is not an easy question to answer at institutional level, but if we can't agree on accountability to say that governments are responsible for getting us to Agenda 2030, and we don't push in that same direction, we're never gonna be on track for our collective goals. We're gonna be doing fragmented approaches and very interesting work, but it's not gonna help our friends and colleagues and others around the world, including in Afghanistan and outside Afghanistan. Right, and then the informal space, I find equally engaging and interesting as well. Um, and at the end of that, we're trying to engage learners in this space and understanding that they are also accountable in different ways. How do we describe those informal accountabilities? Really interesting work. And again, at the end, testing for goodness of fit about what that learning experience offered to their life and career and what that looks like and change over time. Again, lifelong learning as our collective goal. So that's a lot, but I wanted you to walk away with an understanding that accountability is not one thing. Accountability means different things in different contexts, and we need to get comfortable thinking about accountability as we talk about uh, rolling out new programs, not only in commercial senses, but also in terms of social justice, right? So TLC plus r and right? Leading to relevance. What is, that, what is that connection and relationship with relevance? Great. So I'll stop there and just wanted to raise a few questions with you, but I welcome your thoughts and feedback on, you know, what Asia Pacific is doing. I have a lot more slides if you wanted to see examples of challenges in specific countries. Um, and we can also talk about some of these key questions. One for me is how can UNESCO as this you know, large UN system contribute to your advocacy work with government? What collective barriers you see emerging and how we can you know, leverage those opportunities uh, and how we can collaborate personally. I'm interested in how we can work on accountability frameworks. That's my own research interest and certainly in action research. How can we work on that together in larger projects going forward? Um, and how can we support uh, the transformative work for relevant micro-credentials, because I think the financing piece is fundamental. The competitiveness question that came up. For me, this is something that we talk about, you know, supporting refugees and migrants, but the resources to do that uh, and, you know, the operationalization of that is extremely complex and largely focused on pilot efforts, right? So we have to get beyond pilots if we're gonna be on track for Agenda 2030, right? So I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And um, I'm happy to discuss your ideas. Uh, and welcome the opportunity to be with you and to learn with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>